our first opportunity as the body of Christ to celebrate and remember 
what Jesus did for us. All of our sins have been forgiven. We are eternally righteous. We are healed. We are favored. We are protected. We have provision because God loved us so much that he sent his son. And I'm reminded to remember all that he did for us. Do you realize that all around the world, the body of Christ has unity around this? We may not agree on music. We may not agree on style. But we have unity around what Jesus did for us. And before we do this, Joe, would you sing, What Could Wash Away My Sin? If you'll help me this morning. Yes. Oh, the blood of Jesus. take the bread that represents his body. He allowed his body to be beaten and broken so that you and I could know wholeness. Today, I'd like to settle that you're through trying to be whole. You receive wholeness. It's reality. So let's take the bread representing our wholeness. Mm. And oh, the blood. Oh, the blood. I read something from one of the men. You know, if somebody breaks into the house you used to live in, you don't care. Right? Because you don't live there no more. Because of the, bl the blood of Jesus... We don't live in sin anymore. We don't live there anymore. So today, let's decide that we're going to let this blood do for us what Jesus and God intended it to do. Every sin covered. Every sin covered. Let's take... Father, we just love you. We wish we could love you the way that you love us. We know we're on our way. And it's because of what Jesus did for us. We have health in our bodies. We have health in our relationships. We have health in our finances. We have health in every area of our life because you do exceedingly abundantly above all that we can think or ask according to the power that you sent 
to live inside of us. Father, we just want to say thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And everybody said amen. We're going to go back into worship. Amen. Let's continue to worship this morning. Will you lift your hands with me? Lord, we're so ready for all that you want to do in and through us this year. You say it is time. Come on, let's sing this together. Sing it's time. It's time for the sleeper. Shine. 
Daddy, we're opening the windows. We're letting the light in. Yes. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. You said that in you there is no darkness. There's only light. So today, Daddy, we just welcome that light. We're grateful. We're just grateful that you loved us so much that you said, I have a plan. It's a plan to prosper you, to give you a future and a hope and love and eternity with me. And so for that, we say thank you. So yes. Crossing Church, let's let him know how much we appreciate and love him and honor him and worship him and adore him. Let's give him all the praise. Yes. 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 Well, welcome to the first Sunday in 2022, 2021 is done, is done. If we haven't had a chance to meet, my name is Reggie. I have the privilege of serving on staff here at The Crossing. And on behalf of our senior pastor and Pastor Stacy and all The Crossing staff, welcome. Welcome to The Crossing. This can be your home if it's not already. We want to walk with you and be part of your life. There are people watching online in their jammies and their sleeping bags and blankets and snuggly things because it's cold outside. So Crossing Church, let's welcome everybody that's joined us online. Yeah. Yeah. So this morning... I am your video announcements, so what we're going to do first is I want you to turn to a few people, hug them, kiss them, bump them, whatever you do, whatever you do, and just let them know, Happy New Year, yes! Yeah. Yeah. So if you would take your seats, just a couple of announcements. So this Wednesday at 7 o'clock, we're going to have our first Wednesday worship night of 2022. So you're going to want to be there for that. And you know that we've already started 37 days, started yesterday. So there are books in the lobby. You can download a version from the website, and you can also watch the daily devotionals on YouTube or on our website. So I want you to make sure you do that. The other thing you need to know is that January 16th, two Sundays, we're going to have baptism. And for those of you that have recently accepted Christ or you've decided that it's time to make a change, it's time to make a change, come get baptized again. You can register online, okay? So, I'd like for all of you to stand back up again and welcome our senior pastor, Pastor Randy! Yeah! Thank you, man. Love you, buddy. Love you, man. Thank y'all. Thank y'all. You can be seated. Happy New Year to all of you. 2021 is in the books. We want to be thinking about, let me see what I got going on here. We want to be thinking about what do you want to leave in 2021 and what do you want to bring over? I got, uh, that's actually, I mean that for real. Uh, and I want to encourage you in this as you begin to walk through these 37 days. I realize that some of you may be new to us. And in fact, I know many of you are new to us and you're wondering, what's all this 37 days talk? Some, some years ago, many years ago, uh, really God birthed just the real meaning of the tithe. And it's not just to come and get 10% of your money income, throw it down there. It's a principle of bringing everything about your life, giving your first and your best to God. And the, and the, the deal is this, God says, if you bring your first and your best, I'll bless all the rest. 
His blessing on 90% is better than your blessing on 100%. And it's that way, it, and it's not a legalistic thing. God doesn't need your money, he's, he's rich. Uh, he doesn't need it. It's about obedience, and you'll hear that a lot today. Really, the blessing is on obedience. And he gives us things that are doable to do, n- not to make it hard for us. He does to see, will you trust me? Will you trust me? Don't give your last 10%, because after you've paid all your bills and you give your last, well, then you know you got that. I- I'll tell you, one of the tough things that we began to learn was, man, trust him with the first check. Yes. Pastor, you're already talking about money. Well, I'll get off of it. This is actually something I'm excited about. We've lived this way our whole life, and I've seen God bless and his provision on it. So I don't say that to you. I mean, you do what, you, what you know, is right between you and the Lord. I'm inviting you into the blessed life that God has provided. And he does have concern for your finances, and he will bless your finances. So don't be afraid. I'm not a preacher who's afraid to talk about finances. Uh, you don't have to give it. <clears throat> but I'm just telling you, you're invited in to his life of blessing. So we took the first 10% of our year, about 20, probably 15 years ago maybe, uh, I just was uh, convicted or actually invited again. Lord, what do you want us to do? He's bring the first 10% of your year. 37 days is a little more than 10% of the year. Not trying to be legalistic, but we're wanting to, to just say to God, God, our first and our best is yours. For many churches today, and it's a good thing, uh, pastors are standing up and saying, man, we're going to do this this year and this this year and these eight goals and these 12 things, and probably a good pastor would be doing that, <clears throat> and, uh, but you got me. Uh, but no, here, here's, here's, uh, it's, kind of, it's counterintuitive because we're all go, 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 give us a list. What are we going to do? But the scripture says those who wait on the Lord will renew their strength. And so as we enter the year, before we make our list and present them to God to bless, we want to say, God, what's on your list? Would you bring, would you begin to warm up the things that you want us to pay attention to this year? We can't do everything. There's a thousand great things to do. Uh, We can't do them all. We need the Lord to breathe on those things that are our church's assignment, and you need to do the same thing in your personal life. So we take this first part of the year, not to make a bunch of plans, but to listen, to pray, and to seek God. And so I encourage you, it's going to be a great time. I hope you've already seen a couple of the first of these here. Uh, this, this first week, well, I'll, I'll get into that here in a second. Uh, every year, though, I do ask the Lord for a, I ask him for a word. You know, what's, what's your word? And the word he gave me back in August for 2022, I was, I'm apprehensive about because I have a little bit of a love uh, frustration with this particular word. Uh, but I know this is the word of the Lord, so hear me. It's the word revival. Everybody say revival. revival. When we begin to enter into a year like this revival, it, and, and I want you to know, a lot of it has to do with what's going on in Pastor Randy between me and the Lord. There are some things, and this is just the natural drift. If you've been a Christian for 150 years, or if you, this is your second day of being saved, or if you're not even born again, you just came because somebody drug you up here going, you need to make a New Year's resolution to go to church. For whatever reason that you're here, I believe it's by the sovereignty of God. And I do want you to know, <clears throat> becoming a Christian doesn't mean you start on day one of salvation and then you just get great from there on and everything just goes great. Our natural drift is not toward godly things. Our natural drift is toward independence. And the more independent we become, the more controlling we become, uh, the more dulled our spirit becomes. And and again, this isn't a, you're a bad person if this happens, you're a normal person if this happens. And throughout the scripture, many reviving times were called. Israel was always constantly going through the cycle of God does something great. They drifted away from God. Something calamitous would happen. They would return to God. They would be revived. And you see this pattern through humankind all the way. So I say all that to say, uh, we want to set aside this time. I believe that the Lord has invited us to everybody here that would like to have your spirit revived. I believe has invited us into it. And the, the scripture that is, you know, it's, it's, on most of your, it's on most of your refrigerators. Many of you that are believers, you got a t-shirt with this on it. It's gonna be the theme of our 37 days. It's Second Chronicles 714, and it's what the book is built around. Let me explain. Solomon in, in Second Chronicles has just built this fabulous temple for God. God had been living in a tent. I say living in a tent. The heavens are, are the home of the Lord. But Israel had a place where they met with God, and it was a tent and an altar. Solomon built this beautiful uh, temple 
for the Ark of the Covenant to be brought into the presence of God where Israel would now worship. That was completed. When he did that, he called all of Israel together and they had enormous sacrifices, like tens of thousands of lambs and bulls and all of the kinds of things were sacrificed before God as a way of saying, God, we give you our first and our best and we trust you and this is what you've asked for under the old covenant. It was blood sacrifice of animals. God answers by fire. That's always a good sign, by the way, if you're wondering, is, is, is God paying attention? If he ever answers with fire and burns something up, that might be a clue. He, he answers with fire and burns up all of these sacrifices. And uh, then the temple, it'd be something similar to this. It filled with literal smoke. The glory of God actually filled the temple. And the glory means weight. It means the weight of God. He just, le- he just leans on you a little bit, and that's why a lot of times you'll see people go to their knees or even to the floor in the presence of God. The weight of the Lord filled that temple so that nobody could stand. And if you wanna know what revival would look like if we could see it, it would look like the weight of God being such that it overwhelms. The point of revival is it's, it's beyond just explaining and concept and all that. It's, it's literal contact with the living God. It's experience. It's experience, and I'm, I'm the guy that's just, and I think, it's, I think God puts hungers in us, but I've hit a spot, and over the last two years, you've heard me say multiple times, church the way we, we do it has accomplished which, what church the way we do it is going to accomplish. We've had the impact doing it this way. We're gonna have, and yet the world still needs far more from us. So what is the answer? The answer is to us to come before God and say, God, we are your partner on this earth. What do we need to change? One thing we need, we can explain the paint off the wall. We need experience. We're explaining things we're not experiencing. And at some point, it's righteous. It's not unrighteous to know, hey, you know, you, there should be some frustration in you at some point to go, God, we've been talking about healing for 20 years. I want to see it. God, we've been talking about the move of your spirit. We want to see it. We can explain and explain, and it's good. We need that. But at some point, the hunger gets to where you go, Lord, I need contact, full contact. That's what revival begins to look like. Solomon has seen full contact, but he's got the wisdom, and you'll see this throughout the, those first chapters of Second Chronicles. He's got the wisdom to pray this, God, we're killing it right now. I mean, we're having church. You are catching stuff on fire, that's a good sign. And uh, you're filling the temple with smoke when we worship. That's pretty, that, I don't know if it gets any better. However, you've given me wisdom, and this is what I know about the people of God. We tend to drift, and we will drift from you, Lord. We know that. He's praying this in his wisdom. Lord, my prayer is this. When we drift, would you be merciful to us and draw us back to yourself? Would you be merciful, God? Somebody's prayed that prayer over the moment we're in. So God answers here in Second Chronicles 7. Again, many of you have memorized this, said God appeared to Solomon that very night and said, I accept your prayer. Yes, I have chosen this place as a temple for sacrifice, a house of worship. And if, everybody say if. If I, God, ever shut up the supply of rain from the skies or order the locusts to eat the crops or send plague on my people. In other words, if I do what you've asked me to do, if I cause calamity on the earth, sort of like we're seeing right now, and I shake it so that my people realize, hey, I want your attention. If I allow this kind of thing and my people recognize it, and my people, my God-defined people, all of you here that have said yes to Jesus, you, me, us, respond by humbling themselves, praying, seeking my presence, and turning their backs on their wicked ways, I'll be there ready for you. I'll listen from heaven, forgive their sin, and restore. Everybody say restore. I'll restore their land to health. From now on, I'm alert day and night to the prayer offered in this place. Praise God. Revival, as, and when I say the word, I know that many of you have something kind of that you picture in your mind. And uh, I want to let you know, and again, if you're new to faith, I want just hang in here with me. I had two sermons ready. I had a very practical, make good goals and all that, and it would have been awesome. But 
uh, I'm kind of just talking to you today out of my heart as the pastor here as we enter this year to let you know I've just I've got a burden and uh, when I say revival let me kind of take you back there's several versions of it some of you remember back in the day if you, you when you would see on a church sign uh, April 22nd through April 27th revival revival week and uh, and what that meant was you know there's going to be preaching toward getting people saved bring your friends we've set aside this week and that's that's a type of revival it's a good thing uh, and we're going to do that at the end of this month, by the way. We're going to have three days that we set aside holy unto the Lord. And we're going to come not to, don't take this the wrong way, but not to, not to entertain people, but to entertain him and to welcome him uh, as we do always, hopefully. But uh, so there you got the, you got the, the uh, April 21st through 27th. The, the issue is what, what happened on the 28th? Where did he go? Uh, the other revival, and some of you might think these kinds of things, and, and if you're from a Pentecostal or a charismatic background, which is me, I just from day one, I was raised in charismatic and Pentecostal circles, you might think of it as a, a, a time of gathering for extraordinary expressions of the Holy Spirit. It's a very real thing, where folks are baptized in the Holy Spirit, uh, 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 empowered uh, uniquely, and uh, with speaking in tongues, uh, in a charismatic type revival, you would see people laid out on the floor, uh, lots of prayer, believing for miracles, extraordinary, and this is a form of uh, a revival. I was raised now uh, in, in this particular setting, and back in the, in the 90s, there were little pockets of revival like that happening uh, around the United States. Our church uh, here, I was not the pastor, uh, but my, my, my pastor was a revival-hungry guy, precious, great brother, and so was I. Uh, we, we began to go visit these places where these extraordinary meetings were happening, and uh, the, some of them had prayed for years. We didn't do the praying. We just wanted the revival, and so we went. I'm going to be very real with you, by the way. We went and we picked up all the songs that they were singing in those revivals and came back and did them, and they were wonderful. And we looked at some of the methods and some of the things that they were doing, some of the sermons they were preaching. We began to invite some of the type ministers, and, and, and we'd do, hey, April 21st through the 28th. We did that, and we set these meetings up, and uh, we worked as hard as we could to manufacture the same thing we saw and we did this for quite a while, probably about two years. We were chasing in, 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 kind of anything that would happen. Oh, that's got to be God. And, and I'm not saying it wasn't. I'm just saying what we were doing and emulating it, something was missing because we were running our staff to death and we were running our people to death. The, the truth was we had a romantic version of revival in our head Sort of a, wouldn't it be cool if our church was one of those in churches doing revival and we missed, we missed the boat, and I confess that to you. But I remember a Thursday night, Jeff, Jeff Collins was here, and Jeff Collins is a tremendous revi revivalist. He was here from like a Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. It was a Thursday night. There were less than 50 people here because we had worn them flat out. And uh, our pastor, you know, I remember my pastor saying, should we continue this revival? And I'm, I'm telling you, I was sick that whole week, not physically, but just like, this can't be it. it this is not what I see in scripture. I feel like we're faking something in good, with good intent that isn't genuine. Something's not genuine here. And so he said, should we continue this revival? I just wanted to say, I don't think we ever started it. <laughs> I don't think there's anything to continue. Uh, do we continue killing ourselves with meetings? And I'm telling you, something died in me that night. I quit. I, in fact, I was disgusted, and, and I had to work out a whole lot of cynicism that was wrong. But nonetheless, I just said, "The heck with all this. I'm not crowing. I'm not laughing. I'm not jumping. I'm not falling. I'm done with the circus. Uh, God, when I look at the scripture, I don't see anybody having to manufacture healing. They were blind. They saw. They didn't just get a little better and then they, were, they died the next day. It was genuine. That's the power of God. I believe it's real. 
lives changed. And I'm not putting down any of those things. Some great and tremendous things happened. I'm just saying my attempts at it made me have to discover what, am I, what do I mean when I say revival? And so I want you, as you hear the word, and I don't discount any of these other things. If something extraordinary happens and that pillar catches on fire and you levitate off the ground and everybody speaks in a foreign language, praise the Lord. Uh, but I'm not, I'm, I'm not going to work. There's not going to be an ounce of manufactured anything coming out of me. It's either God or bust. I ain't playing. Uh, I've been there, done that. So uh, don't be offended. There, there's another thing, and instead of, not instead of, but, you know, there's extraordinary works of the Holy Spirit, but I put this as my definition. Revival, it's, it's not just the extraordinary expressions of the Holy Spirit, but the intensification of the ordinary expressions of the Holy Spirit. Now, just think about that for a second. The, the, the intensification of the ordinary. Now, here's what I mean by that. When the, when the Holy Spirit is man, he's always here, but how far our spirit is from his and the kind of contact, again, it, the experience we're having. A lot of it's very mental and very discussed and very explained, but how we're encountering the, the person, the Holy Spirit. When, when he's manifesting in his ordinary way, here's number one. Conviction of sin is ordinary. It's ordinary. For, for us to walk in sin, and I know I'm going to sound like an old-fashioned preacher, and y'all are going to go, Pastor, what happened? But when we talk about the ordinary work of the Holy Spirit, when holiness comes into the room and you're aware of it, the first thing you recognize is you're not holy. When his holiness is, and I've been in rooms where conviction is so strong, if you've had the holiest week of your life, you're still sensing, I need to bow down because I'm in the presence of something so far holier than I am. And it's the Isaiah experience. In Isaiah 6, Isaiah went to church, and the last person he, he expected to see there was God. He walks in the building and says, oh, my God, I, I, I saw the Lord high and lifted up, sitting on his throne. The train of the robe filled the entire temple. There was smoke everywhere, and I could hear angels in a loud voice so loudly saying, holy, 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 that the foundation shook, and I fell on my face. Isaiah, probably the holiest guy in all of Israel, met with holiness. Now, God was there the whole time, but he encountered it. He experienced it. He didn't have to explain it. He felt it. Revival. I know when I say the word feel, I know some of you back up and go, whoa, whoa, whoa. We're so busy explaining, we're, we're afraid to experience. He's real. He's real or he's not. I mean, this, this, is, this is or it isn't. <laughs> and it is. And he experienced it. And he said, oh, my God. His unholiness he recognized. Well, the Holy Spirit, when he begins to manifest in ordinary ways, before you speak in tongues, levitate, catch on fire, any of the fun stuff, you sense Oh, my God, I am in the presence of holiness. Lord, search me. I'm a man of unclean lips. And it's not guilt and it's not self-loathing and all of that religious stuff. It's a genuine bowing down. And here's the, the conundrum of his holiness. It's like Isaiah. Isaiah thought this. If I stay here, I'm going to die. But I so want to stay here. I want to be with you, God. But if I stay here in your holiness, I'm going to die. The most dangerous thing to the planet is not nuclear war. The most dangerous thing to humanity is the holiness of God. It's more powerful than any of that. And if he had not put a buffer between his holiness and our flesh, you, we, we, you couldn't get close to him without dying. Everybody that touched him in the Old Testament, they just lifted the lid on the, on the Ark of the Covenant and 70,000 people dropped dead. That's all the woodlands dropped dead like that. It is, it is, it is real and not anything to, to monkey with. His holiness is holy. And had he not said to Isaiah, let me touch your lips because I want you to stay and you ought to want to stay, but you're right. If you stay in my holiness, you will die. So I'm going to fix it so you can stay and be safe. 
And when you accept Jesus, what you're saying is, what he's done for you is saying, here, I'm doing for you because I want you in my presence. Gang, what I'm describing to you, it's real. And I've been in the meetings where you didn't have to explain it to the floor. We're just simply at the beginning of worship. Something changed in the room. And sinners, and here's the second thing, sinners are converted. There's people saved. And it's not hard. It's not like, uh, I promise you we're going to give you $50 and a parking place if you'll just come get saved. It's not begging and pleading for you. That, that, Isaiah, that tension thing of, I want to be in your presence, but I don't, I don't belong here. What do I do? Do I stay? Do I go? And you can't wait to say, how do I get right with God? And it's real. There's a revival in the New York City. New York City. Of all places, in 1857, the Jeremiah Lamphere revival, and this wasn't led by a church. No preacher is known here, Jer- Jeremiah Lamphere. The only reason he's known is because he's the businessman that decided we want to pray for lost people to get saved. We trust, and he had been under the preaching of the power of the Holy Spirit to convert sinners. And so he puts up a bunch of pamphlets out in the, in the middle of town and says, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be at this church to pray from noon till one every day. Join me if you can. First day he, he, he comes, 12 to 12.30, he's there by himself. A couple of people wander in. By the end of the week, there's six or seven. Over the next several, two or three or four weeks, there's 30 people gathering to pray. Gang, they're not preaching. They're praying. They start confessing their sins to one another, why? Nobody was telling him to do that because the Holy Spirit is real. I mean, he comes to engage our spirit and we don't need a lot of preaching when that's happening. There's just a lot of quiet and a lot of, oh my God. When he comes, you don't have to wonder, am I okay with you, Lord? You either are or you're not. And the good news is, it's not bad, it's good news. I wanna know, purge me with your holiness. Purge me. Meant by, by, as the weeks and the months went on, 10,000, 30,000. Uh, the place, uh, the, the New York Times wrote an article saying they visited as many people, places as they could. Everywhere they went, there were gatherings of people, business people, that just started coming to these prayer meetings all over New York City. Millions of people saved with no central headquarters, no organization, nobody. God, the Holy Spirit, saying, if you'll do what I've said, if you'll humble yourself and pray, instead of you doing all the work trying to manufacture something, I'll come and do something you, you, you couldn't teach a million years and understand. I'll do something in the spirit and the heart of man because I love him more than anybody. That happened in New York City in 1857, the Second Great Awakening, all that great stuff that happened there. Sinners are converted. Uh, number three, uh, hard to, 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 well, what was my, my sorry, did I get this down? Assurance, yeah, yes, yes. The Holy Spirit comes, there is assurance, assurance of salvation. This is the Romans 8, 16, all through that pocket there where it says, uh, you know, we don't feel like we're loved and accepted by God, and our drift is to not feel loved and accepted. So we need the Holy Spirit to come and assure us, no, his spirit confirms with our spirit, no, you're a son, you're a daughter of God. Gang, I crave that. I crave it. Pastor Randy, you, you're a pastor. You should know you're saved. I know I'm saved. I can explain it to my toenails. Uh, I, I, can, I, I can explain and preach grace t- till I'm blue in the face, until you're tired of me, me it's talking about it. But sometimes I just need to feel it. I just, and you know what? Here's the good news. He knows I'm this way. He comes to assure you, you're good, we're good. I need that. And lastly, the work of the Holy Spirit, just the ordinary work of the Holy Spirit, sanctification, which means this, living holy, behaving, behaving holy. I know this sounds so old-fashioned. You're like, my God, what happened to our pastor? I, I've, I have aged, but it's, this is not old-fashioned. This is the gospel. This is our helper. And this is how the Holy Spirit works. And when he's at work, we don't have to work so hard to explain everything from the Greek and the Hebrew and all that. That's all good. 
I've kind of reached a point with the Lord where I said, Lord, I don't want to keep doing this. I don't want to keep walking around the same. I mean, this is good. I am so unsatisfied. I'm just unsatisfied. Not with y'all, not with me, not with church. We couldn't do church better. I love our church. Love our worship. But I, I can sense, yeah, hallelujah. Yeah, we got somebody sanctified over there. I hear you, baby. Everybody's going to get it. I just have reached a place in so many, so many times in my prayer, I just am overwhelmed. I just get overwhelmed. Like, Lord, I got nothing else to say. I, need, what, I don't know what to do. I need you to do what you do. And how do I get out of your way? I mean, honestly, that's a whole lot of my... How do we get all of this out of your way? What, what do you need? My brother was, called me the other day, and he was telling me about a funeral of a, a pastor, Mike Hankins in Dallas, a precious, godly brother. And uh, it was a surprise to me, but he told me about Joe and Becky, who used to work with uh, Pastor Mike, going there to do the worship at this funeral. And, uh, and he started describing what happened in the room when they began to worship. And I said, Larry, well, that happened here. In fact, when, when Joe sang at the Women's Ornament Exchange, I mean, that was, a, that was a, a shindig. Everybody was in happy, you know, fun place. But when Joe began to sing, Oh, Holy Night, everybody started getting quiet. And that's tough when you got 600 women, 500, whatever you got. <laughs> getting close to miracle water walking level here. Folks start quiet, start paying attention to the stage. Waiters, waiters were walking and they just stopped. What is that? What does that? How come somebody can sing a song and you go, hey, that was really good. Somebody can sing a song and you go. Uh. And it's, I mean, Joe's a monster singer, it's not that. And that's fantastic. But it's, it's years of learning that the buzz isn't being able to sing great. The, the buzz, if you will, is understanding I am hosting the very presence of God. And when that light comes on in a worshiper and we've got a whole bunch of them, something starts changing in the room. And, uh, and we're, we're, we're on the cusp of it. In uh, the 1970s, the last coast-to-coast -coast revival that we had in uh, the early 1970s, there were across in all the universities. Some of you are old enough to remember the Jesus movement. But in the, the 1970s, college campuses would have InterVarsity or a Chi Alpha or Campus Crusade for Christ, all of these groups on their, their schools, but they'd have eight members, 12 members, 15 members. Well, one year there was 10 and 15 and 20 members in these things. And then as God began to move, these things went like to, to, to 200. These groups started filling up as college kids. Again, no central organization, no central church, teaching seminars on how to have revival and how to have revival in your college. None of that was happening. These radical college kids start turning to Jesus instead of drugs, and it was led by the Holy Spirit because it had the marks of the Holy Spirit. They were convicted of their sin. Now, this will be a shocker. By the thousands, folks that were sleeping with their girlfriend moved out when they got saved. That's new that we actually get saved and then change, but it happened when the Holy Spirit is working like that. that these kids radically changed directions for their lives. They were doing drugs and smoking all kinds of stuff. They would bring their drugs and their paraphernalia to the church and set it down and walk away from it. Transformation, life change, that's called repentance. Yeah. Repentance and salvation, they're inseparable. The way you know one, you don't repent to get saved, but when you get saved, you repent. Yeah. You change direction, there's a marked thing. This is when the Holy Spirit is moving. A guy like me is not begging you, please quit sleeping with your girlfriend. <laughs> And I'm not beating you up. Uh, one, of the, one of the deepest, most difficult things in our church and in the church is the sexual sin. It's so intoxicating. And that's not said to beat you up. I'm not beating anybody up. 
I'm saying when you're intoxicated with that, it's going to take something more than making a New Year's resolution, not to sleep with my girlfriend. And that's going to make you till about next Tuesday. <laughs> There's sin that's got us in this room captive that without the Holy Spirit, you're stuck and you know it. And I'm not saying that to, 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 to punch you. I'm saying it to say there is a work of the Spirit that goes beyond just finding the information and trying to do it. There's a work of the Holy Spirit that says, I will help you do this. And when revival is moving, so pastor, are you talking about, you're, you're expecting this grand thing nationally? I don't know, I hope. Or this regional revival like the Brownsville revival? I don't know, hope. Something, a revival for our church? I don't know, I hope. Here's the one person I can guarantee has to have revival. I don't have to wait for anybody. I don't have to wait for the latest great speaker or a new wave of worship music or something to happen in Canada. I can start right now, and so can you. And this scripture says why and how we have and host revival. And so let me push you a little more. We're going into this time of prayer If something doesn't change in us, most of us will quote this scripture and not do it. If we were already praying, he would already be healing. The challenge for us, and this is throughout the church, is we tweet things we don't do. We wear T-shirts saying we believe certain things. But the most simple thing Prayer is actually not difficult. And again, I'm not shaming. I'm just trying to be literal to say, you and I, when he said, if my people, y'all are his people. If we don't wake up and change, getting a new president, whichever one you want, isn't going to fix it. The people of God are those who can see, wait a minute, this isn't a political solution, is it? This isn't a medical solution for this virus, is it? All the geopolitical stuff happening with China and Russia. Wait a minute, it's not about a leader. There's something else broken here. If my people will recognize the shaking, then I'm allowing this to happen to wake them up and they will wake up and return to me and pray. I will respond. We enter this and, and, and week number one, gang, is the first part of, of that thing. Humble yourself and pray. That's what you're gonna see through here. Humble yourself and pray. As the weeks go on, you'll see Seek My Face and the weeks be shaped that way. So what you're looking for this week as you go through this book is, well, I mean, I'm not into humbling. Can we just skip that and I'll start praying? Why would he start with humble? What does humble mean? Okay, I see my clock here. I'm awesome. What does humble mean? Humble yourself mean? Does that mean go, oh, I'm a terrible person? It's, I'm not talking about self-deprecating. I'm not talking about for all you church folk when somebody says, hey, I really like the way you sing, and you go, oh, it's all God. Uh, <laughs> trust me, it ain't that good. <laughs> if it were all God, it would be way better than that. All of that type, you know, false humility. I'm not talking about any of that. I'm not thinking about thinking less of yourself and none of that. What I want you to hear is, we drift toward an independent spirit. Nobody gonna tell me what to do. You know what I'm saying? That's the edge of it. But even in our walk with God, our drift is toward an independent spirit. Joshua, let me give you this picture. And again, we're gonna pick this up Wednesday night, this Wednesday night. And I wanna tell you, this Wednesday night, when you come, I want you to come prayed up, but I do want you to know, uh, that, and the instruction I have from, from the Lord was, Randy, Quit trying to make a place for people. Make a place for me and invite the people to come welcome me. Make a place for me. So I don't know what's gonna happen Wednesday night. I honestly don't. And, uh, but I want you to know, don't come looking for an entertaining type. You know, we, we've become such a consumer cultured church world to where we're just used to coming. I'll go where the coffees are right and the pastor jeans are cut just right and all this. We got this consumer pick it the way I want it mentality and uh, it's got us as far as it's gonna get us. We need now a people of God that say, you know what, whether the pastor's jeans are skinny or slim, I think I can handle it. I just wanna go someplace 
and be a part of the welcoming committee for the presence and the power of God. We need God. We need God. So come Wednesday with that mindset. Very quickly, this is Joshua chapter 5. Joshua's taken on a very difficult assignment. He is now looking at the walls of Jericho, and this is what I want to start to brew in your mind. I'm going to get back to humility, trust me. He's thinking in his mind, I have never fought. We're, I got a bunch of farmers, and we're used to fighting out in the open in fields. We've never taken on uh, uh, walls like this. These are you know, 18-foot-high walls that are chariots drive on top of it. Never seen anything like it. And Joshua's out observing after they've gone into Canaan, and he's thinking, here's what I can do. Maybe I can use a battering ram. Maybe I can use a ladder system. He's thinking logically. How can I get past this impasse? And that's the word I want to start to stick inside of you. It's the word for the day. Where's your impasse in your life? Joshua's looking at this impasse, and while he's looking at it, Joshua 5, 13 says, when Joshua was near the town of Jericho, he looked up and saw a man standing in front of him with a sword in his hand. And Joshua went up to him and demanded, are you friend or foe? Are you with us or are you against us? Neither one, he replied. I'm the commander of the Lord's army. I'm not with you or them. And this, at this, Joshua fell with his face to the ground in reverence. And now you're going to start to see what humility looks like. He fell with his face to the ground in reverence. I'm at your command. I, I'm not in charge here. I'm surrendering to your plan. You tell me, what to, you tell me how high to jump, and I'm going to try, to try my best. This is starting to get into the humility that I want to talk about. I'm at your command, Joshua said. What do you want your servant to do? The commander of the Lord's army. And by the way, this is Jesus. This is a Christophany. It's what it's called in the Old Testament. It's an appearance of the Lord Jesus. The commander of the Lord's army is Jesus. The commander of the Lord's army replied, take off your sandals for the place where you're standing is holy. And Joshua did so. Sandal, you took your sandals off. Your slave took his sandals off. It's a way of saying, I am subservient to you. My independent spirit, I'm going to take care of this. I'm going to hard charge and make this all happen my way or the highway. I lay all that down. I'm here to surrender to you. And so Jesus gives him a plan that makes absolutely no sense. The way your army is going to win this war, he said, is I want you to get the priest to take the Ark of the Covenant, which is my holy presence. I want you to honor my presence. I want seven priests to take seven ram's horn. The ram's horn was the shofar. It was a worshiping instrument. For the Hebrew mind, it went all the way back to Abraham, where Abraham went up the hill, and I'm, I'm, you're gonna have to trust me. Abraham went up the mountain when God said, I want you to sacrifice your child to me. He was testing Abraham. And before Abraham could sacrifice his own son to God, an angel grabbed his arm, and there was a ram in the thicket. That ram became the sacrifice for his child. This is a picture of God. God didn't stay the knife when he, when he was going to take his own son. God actually took the life of his own son. He became the sacrificial lamb. But for Abraham and the Hebrews, for them to be born and birthed through Isaac, this lamb was sacrificed so all these people could be born. And that ram's horn was taken. And that horn, this is where Abraham said of God, you are Jehovah Jireh. In other words, you are God my supply. Whatever I lack or need, you are Jehovah Jireh. So when these priests are marching in front of the Ark of the Covenant, blowing this, this sound, they're, they're just honoring. They don't have a plan. They're not saying we're going to come over those walls. All they're saying is our God is here and he will make a way. He will supply. And the plan was this. Every day for six days, walk around th those walls one time and go home. And Joshua told the army, y'all don't say a word. Keep your mouth shut. Because you know what a bunch of soldiers would have been doing? It's the dumbest plan I've ever seen. What do we got the band up here for? Band needs to be on the sideline. They can play at halftime. Why can't we get out there and do this? No. God's leading with his holy presence. He's saying, no, you carry my presence and you just walk around that big problem and honor me. Day after day. One lap. Honey, what'd y'all do today? Did y'all kill anybody? No. Did the walls crack? No. What are y'all doing tomorrow? Same thing. Day after day, that army lined up behind the presence of God, and they walked around this, that wall. Now, if I were God and he would take any advice from me, 
at least by day three or four just to encourage them out of had a little crack in the wall something or a brick fall off the top to, to go look we're making progress is anybody here in a long prayer battle anybody can feel what I'm feeling here I'd like to see a little progress here you know what God was saying this is what humility is humility is saying I don't logically see how walking around these walls is getting anything done but at your word I'll do it I, I don't get Naaman, go, go dip in the, the Jordan seven times. It's a dumb plan to get free of your leprosy. Go Why? Because I said, I want you to humble yourself. Humility releases the power of God to flow. Nothing medicinal in the Jordan River. Naaman went and dipped seven times. Uh, the lepers, when Jesus healed him, he didn't actually heal them while they were in front of him. He said, you guys go and report to the priest that you're healed. And while they were on their way, while they were obeying, their healing came. I don't understand all this. All I know is this. When God is, when God's, when he's here, the answer's here, whether I can logically see it or not. And if all he's told me to do is pray, if that's what he promised, Guys, we can do this. We can march around the city. Nothing happened. March around it again. Nothing happened. March around it again. On the seventh day, they marched around seven times. It took an hour per lap. It's a terrible plan. The army had to be exhausted on the seventh, seven hours walking. And those walls fell in. And Israel took that city for God, not because of any strength of their own, but because they honored the presence of God and God did the heavy lifting. Now, guys, there's some, there's some things in here, and I'll bring this down. We'll pick this up Wednesday. I just believe God's invited us into this kind of humility. By this means this, Pastor Randy, why, why should I pray? I don't get it. Uh, let the prayers do the praying. Here's the deal. You need to humble yourself. It's just talking to God. It's really, he's not asking you to, you know, run a three-second, hundred-yard dash, pray. I've never done. I'm not comfortable with that. Listen, all my guys, all my girls, go. you pick 20 minutes out of every day this week. Schedule it now. God, I've never really prayed, but here's what I'm going to do. You start by thanking him. I thank you for my wife. Thank you for my kids. Thank you for my income. I thank you, Lord, for this car I'm in. I thank you. I thank you. Just thank him for some things. Next, let, let your anxiety be your secretary, if you will. All of your worries, trust me. If you don't know how to pray, you do know how to worry. So worry. Worry out loud. God, my children. God, our finances. God, our future. God, the nuttiness going on in our nation. God, this virus. Worry out loud. Bring your needs to the Lord. Pastors, when you say pray, that's what I'm talking about. That's what I'm talking about. Talk to God. Talk about his life. Talk about your life. Talk about the Bible. Go through your devotional. Here's what I want you to know. As you're walking around, yesterday I came in here to pray. Man, I had the best, we've had the best prayer meeting already on January the 1st. Our church may have ever had. I was the only, only one here. It was still great. I've never done this. I'm not a Jerry Cole March kind of guy, trust me. I started walking around this sort of accidentally. I just start drifting around it and all of a sudden I start counting going, well, man, the more I pray, the more God begin to raise up things in my life that have been impasses. Can't seem to break this. Can't get past here. And as I just walked around here, I'd say, Lord, you are Jehovah Jireh. I've done all I can do. I don't know what else to do. My strength is spent, but yours is not. The outcome is on you. The obedience is on me. I worship you. You are God. You are quite able. And the more I walked, the more things started coming up. This Wednesday, I want you to come with your impasses. Bring the hard stuff. Keep the easy stuff. Deal with that the next week. I mean, the stuff, I mean, I got something I've been praying for for 15 years, and I hadn't seen one stone drop yet. What are you going to do, Pastor Randy? I'm going to live at peace. I'm going to honor the presence of God. I got a promise from God. 
I wish I had time to get into this. I do want you to know there, before they ever started, God said this to Joshua, I have given you the city. Past tense, that this is done. I'm telling you, now you get started on what I have already done. When you begin to get that into your heart, that whatever it is you're facing, you're facing it, but it's behind him. He's not facing it, it's behind him. I have already. You can begin to say, thank you, God. I don't walk by faith, I, walk, I don't walk by sight, I walk by faith. I look with spiritual eyes. Even in this room right here, I believe there's some folks where the, the Holy Spirit is saying, this is your impasse. Sin that's just beat you for years, years after years after year. Can't break this thing. Here, good news for you. You're not going to in your willpower, and God's not ashamed of you for fight. Look, you put up a good fight. 2022, these 37 days, something's going to change in the way you approach that battle instead of out of shame by the power of the Holy Spirit. Let's stand to our feet. I could keep going all day. I'd like our prayer teams to come to the front. And if you already have something, you say, you know what? I know my impasse and I'm ready to get on with it. Let the prayer teams pray for you. Anything else that you've got going on in your life. If you're here today and you've never received Jesus Christ as your Savior, I want to lead us in a very quick prayer. And I, the reason I say quick is because it's not a matter of you imitating my prayer. The Holy Spirit is already at work leading you to Christ. I'm just going to I'm just going to kind of bump the door open so you can know what to do. All you're doing is saying, "God, I can't be good enough on my own." But Jesus was good enough as Pastor Reggie basically presented the gospel to us. Jesus came in the flesh because in our flesh we can't be good enough for God. Jesus took our sin in his flesh and he took his perfect record of righteousness and gives it to us. You can't earn it. And if you'll just simply humble yourself and say, Jesus, I want to be saved, but I can't be good enough. He will say, I know you can't, but I can. And I give you my righteousness. We are the righteousness of God when we're in Christ. That's pretty righteous. Not by your behavior or discipline, but as a grace gift. It's a marvelous thing. And it's birthed by the Holy Spirit. And you know who you are right now. It's a wonderful day for you. I want to lead us all in a prayer of salvation. If you want to give yourself to, to, to Jesus, repeat that. Everybody repeating this after me, actually. All heads bowed, all eyes closed, praying this way. Heavenly Father, I am a sinner. I've sinned against you. And I am fully responsible. Please forgive me. I believe Jesus Christ lived for me and bled for me and died for me to pay for my sin so that I could be saved today. I believe you raised him from the dead. He overcame death, hell, and the grave for me. And I receive Jesus as my Savior, as my Lord. I submit to you. Do anything you want with my life. Fill me with your spirit. And thank you for saving me. Praise God. With your heads bowed and your eyes closed, if you just prayed that prayer in a minute, would you lift your hand saying, I gave my life to Christ. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. You are saved to your toenails, saved by the work of the Holy Spirit. Praise God. Praise God. Well, gang, if you would like prayer for anything else, you can make your way this direction. We take our tithes and our offerings at this point. Actually, we, you get to give that either in those boxes or by what you'll see up here on the screens. Just know this. I speak the blessing and favor of God over your finances. Tithing is another one of those things that you go, doesn't make logical sense. But nonetheless, when you begin to trust God and say, Lord, this is what you said do. You, didn't, you could ask for 90% and let me keep 10. But he said, just bring 10. I don't need it. But it shows me your obedience. My blessing will be on your finances. Guys, I've lived this. I invite you this year to have a change in your finances. I bless your finances. I bless your week. You guys get out there and have a great day. And we'll see you back here Wednesday. God willing, see you.